All right, welcome back to Design Carve Sell, where we feature the stories of how people are starting and growing their business with the aid of CNC technology. In this episode, we're chatting with Eric Needham of Needham Woodworks. Eric has carved out a super successful business in the highly niched down market of Euro cabinets for professional audio engineers. Now, these are basically big open cabinets where you wire up all kinds of effects and processors to create audio. And you might have already heard some of that audio before. Some of Eric's past customers have included director JJ Abrams of Lost, Star Trek and Star Wars fame, plus Ludwig Gornson, who created the soundtrack for Black Panther and Disney's Mandalorian. Now, quick aside, if you're watching this interview on YouTube, we weren't able to record any video, so we'll just have the audio feed, but that will be back in the future. And to start off, let's jump to Eric's background with woodworking. Most of my professional career as a software engineer. Oh, okay. Yeah. But as a kid, my, my grandfather was a furniture maker. And I'd spend my summers with them in, in Connecticut and we would build little bird houses and things of that nature, but they weren't the ones where it's four pieces of wood and some nails. They all had interesting joinery and they were just fun projects I'd do with my grandpa. I wasn't really realizing that I was doing something that I would eventually uh, take and make a living with. And it was after 15 years or so of, of doing software, I just w was getting fried and I was, you know, picking woodworking back up just as a kind of a, a meditative thing for me. Um, especially with hand tools, it's just quiet and it's um, deeply therapeutic in its own way. It, it, and now my life is sold with giant noisy machines. But when I was stepping back into it, it was just this quiet thing and, and working on making everything as perfect as possible. To give some context for people, when you're talking about like Euro cabinets, like what is that if people have never seen what you make? So I, I joke that not only is my stuff very niche, it's niche within a niche because not only am I doing cabinets for modular synthesizers, Within the world of modular synthesizers, which I, if anyone doesn't know, that's basically if you take a synthesizer that can make all kinds of different sounds. If you look at, you know, those synthesizers, like the Moog ones from the 70s or the, you know, Korg from then or whatever manufacturer, each of those synthesizers, they're hardwired inside. There's a bunch of knobs and levers and whatnot, and there's a signal path, right? So you play your note. And there's usually an oscillator making a sine wave or a square wave or a sawtooth or something. Then you have a series of knobs that manipulate the sound. So you didn't using like additive or subtractive synthesis or different filters, you can get a different sound. And what modular synthesizer is, is if you take all that functionality, there are different companies will take something that like makes the sine wave or makes the square, it makes the oscillator and they make just that. So there's a module that only performs that function. And then there's another company that performs another f function that, that makes it make a gurgling sound, or I'm just coming up with ridiculous stuff, or it, or it takes that sound and based on, you know, the frequency, it sends a control voltage to another one, which has that manipulate the sound another way. So it's this whole ecosystem of these little modules that are produced by different companies and using patch cables, you go from one to the other. And each one performs a different function to give you the final output is this kind of combination of all these um, manipulations of the original sine wave or, or for whatever the oscillator was putting out. Of all these, what I make are the, the fancy cabinets that hold all these modules. I also make the hardware and the power supplies that are very cl clean and quiet to promote my, <laughs> promote my electronics business, Eschatonic Modular. They, they all fit together. They're all my stuff. Everything is custom made. And that's what I make. So within the world of modular synthesis is what I just described to you. There are probably four or five different formats. And within that, I make a very specific format cabinet for what's called Eurorack, which is a very specific height. The, the unit of measure in that is actually called a one U, one unit, and a minor three unit tall or one unit tall. And then there's a width, which is HP. And a HP, I believe, is like 5.08 uh, millimeters, right? So my basic size is, so if you were to take 120 HP, that's exactly 24 inches. So my standard cabinets are 120, 150, or 168. And that's what I built. People can come back to me and they want different sizes or whatnot, but that's kind of my standard. That's what I make. So it's a niche within a niche. The reason I picked that niche is it allows me to have a lot of flexibility with the shape and style of my cabinets where other ones are quite rigid. They have to be, they have to conform to a specific type of frame or whatever. And, but with Eurorack, I can go wild within reason on the shape and that makes it fun for me. And because honestly, if I had to make boxes all day, I'd rather sit in front of a computer and 
write code that goes obsolete in, in, in three months. It gets refactored. Do you have like a music background? Like how do you even get into I, I do. I've been playing music my entire life. I'm a bass player, but like, I started off on a saxophone and upright bass. I moved to electric. I... I'm not a piano player at all. I took piano lessons. I got into modular synthesis because it was actually a cool thing for me. It was actually very meditative also. I can sit at, at night, spend an hour on a patch and manipulate the sound. It was very relaxing, especially for like ambient type of stuff. But I would make these fancy cabinets that kind of hold stuff because once again, it was another process for me to do something that I enjoy doing. And I was building like little cabinets, little things for, for my stuff, but in, in anticipation for my daughter being born, of course, all the anxiety around having, bringing a new human into the world. I started building these crazy little contraptions with lots of lights and uh, a knob and she was one or two and she was playing around with it. And it was fun. So I, on the, the different forums and whatnot, I was on, I was posting pictures of these and someone reached out to me saying, Hey, can you build one of those for me? I'm like, yeah, not really. You know, it, it's not something I wanted to do to make money. And then someone reached out to me relatively famous. And I, I was like, sure. I, I went ahead and build it, went ahead and built it. And before I knew it, like small orders were coming in. Yeah. You mentioned that your very first sell was just someone had saw the things that you were posting. I built something specifically for my daughter who was at that point one or two, and she liked all the knobs and the lights and the blinky and blue. Obviously she had no idea what she was doing. It was a tactile visual thing. And I posted a picture of that. Unfortunately, the very first person called me, I have an NDA signed, so I can't use this person's names, but I have a number of very famous people over the course of time who make movies that you've seen and have done scores for like Black Panther or Mandalorian. Ludwig Gorenson is, is a big one. And I can use his name, J.J. Abrams, who obviously has done the Star Wars and Lost. He's not a professional musician, but he's a huge uh, modular synthesis nerd. Really? I think he okay. did the, yeah. And he did the score for uh, Lost and he actually has more modules and a, a bigger setup than any of my other. <laughs> any of my like stars. the professional that aren't just the directors yet. Yeah, you know, the guy who did score for Midsummer, which is uh -huh. arguably the scariest movie I've ever seen in my life. And the, yes, the score yeah. is terrifying. So I, is it your unit then in the, I forget what they called it, but the Mandalorian, the behind the scenes where they're talking with Ludwig? And he yes. basically has, is that what you made? That is me. And it was like in the Rolling Stone. And also when they did the making of Mandalorian, I think there's a scene where it's my rig that's like floating through space. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's something crazy behind him. I'm like, that thing looks amazing. That's, that's really cool. Uh, the, yeah. The, it's also, that's my, you know, 0.5. Um, milliseconds of fame, but right. being able to see one of my pieces floating through space on that's a, cool. making of the Mandalorian. Yeah, that was pretty cool. I like that. How did you go from making that kind of for sale to growing the business? Was it like word of mouth? People would see other people yeah. that had it? Is that how it worked? Uh, yeah, I, I think what happened was I, I lucked out. I had no interest in doing this for a living. I was doing fine consulting and I, I've been a software engineer my entire professional life. At that point, I think 15 years under my belt or whatnot. And it's uh, that first one came in, people were asking me to build something. I was no, and this person had made movies that I've seen and I was really excited. So I made him one and I think through his studio, people saw it and on the forums that I was on the quality, I was, I'm a real furniture maker. I build what I believe to be very beautiful pieces. People would get excited and I was making small ones at the time. And over time, people were requesting larger and larger ones. And now the ones I make are just absolutely huge, like seven feet wide, six feet tall and a part of very large studio installations. And they take me a long time to make, but also the price of the commission is such that I can do that. Yeah. Um, then fast forward then to today, is it still pretty much word of mouth? Is that how customers come in? Yeah, um, to, no, okay. absolutely. I literally just started using Google ads, I, uh, search engine marketing. And now, now sales are, are coming in at a velocity where I'm hiring more people. I have a couple of apprentices. They're both part-time and they're both incredible builders and, you know, and whatever it is, like I'll sit down and I don't use CAD and I moved into a co-op um, in San Francisco, which is a gem of a place. It's the last one remaining. It's been a shop since the forties actually. And there's only, a, there's three of us pro professionally in the shop. There's a couple of, you know, retired guys who come in and out, but there's this massive 30,000 square foot facility with a loading dock. And we all share the giant machines, like those sliding tables and the table saws and the band saws and the giant planer and the drum sander and the massive joiner. I, I was in there growing it out. And as some of the people were leaving, because I was doing so much business, I started taking up their bays because everyone kind of has a bay. Now I have half the shop. <laughs> I'm bringing in my own machines and to bring it up to Inventables. I actually, the, uh, the shaper origin guys are not far from me. 
And there's another furniture maker in the co-op from New Zealand who is friends with Sam, who runs marketing and a lot of the artist outreach. So they were coming to the shop getting feedback on their early prototypes. And I got one of those very early on, and I was using that to do some of the more technical templates because my cabinets are just not regular cabinets. I have my own electronics company that kind of, to pun intended, dovetails into this particular cabinet business, but it's all custom to my spec. Now, having those recesses into the back and all these little templates and the, the openings for the power plates and all these little things, I was using the shaper to create the templates and make them which was fantastic. It's precise. The problem is that it's very slow, right? Because it's a ha handheld CNC machine. Using that as much as I could, it was just very slow. And also all the crazy openings for vent holes in the back of my cabinets and stuff I'd use, but it was like, I'd have to be really wanting to do that. You know, I put the headphones on and it would take two hours to do. And it was over the pandemic. You, you guys were raising pre-sales for the, the X-Carve Pro. So I, I put in the order and a year later, whatever, th they came in and it's been an absolute game changer. So all the things that I was using for the, the shaper, I now do in a fraction of the time and, and whatever it is, I'll sit down and I don't use CAD. I, I'm not doing any 3D stuff. So most of my stuff is Adobe Illustrator. And then I can do all my depths using the shapes and whatnot built into the, uh, the easel software. And man, I sit down, I come up with that idea in five minutes. Actually, the longest it takes me is coming up with a clamping solution <laughs> to get everything clamped down. I don't like looking at stuff in, in the computer. It's really hard for me to visualize like, oh, that looks great because I'm making some cabinets that are six feet tall, seven feet tall and seven feet wide. And what I want to do is see the profile because you know, it's ergonomic based because you have to reach different rows of my cabinets to be able to access the knobs and do patching and access the buttons. So making sure it, it flows with the ergonomics of your arm radius of how it goes up and down so you can reach all the different access points. So I'm just knocking out templates super quick. Basically everything over a certain size is custom that we make. It's a total game changer because yeah. otherwise I would be on the Shaper Origin and as much as I love it, it would take me an hour plus with potential. It doesn't do a really good job at straight lines. It would take forever. It wouldn't be a, you know, a perfect mock-up. And then when it came time to doing the actual, the work piece, I go and I, I mill down the wood and I panel it, have it all perfect. And I wouldn't be able to do it on the shaper. What I would do is get a template that's relatively close. I would use my hand tools, like a spoke shave or uh -huh. like a, a flexible sander to get all the sides really smooth and make my template. I go down, trace it, do a rough cut of the bandsaw, put the double stick tape, the template to it and use a, a, a template bit to route the actual work piece to the side. Now I can take the panel that I've made and I can, you know, put two of them on a single panel mirroring each other and the machine cuts it out. Then I have these perfect sides and the straight lines are straight. I take a hand plane over the back just to get the machine marks off and I have these perfectly cut templates and it does the grooves and the dados and the rabbits that I need. It takes a bit change, but then I put the, a smaller bit in for doing the uh, pilot holes for any screws that I need. How long does it take you to go from an order to having a finished project? Honestly, if I were to have only one order and that's all I did, I could probably go from rough lumber to finished in a couple of a few days. No problem. The thing is in order for me to pay rent and feed my family and myself, <laughs> And my apprentices or whatnot, I can't do one at a time. I have to do five, seven at a time. And now it's not just, well, it takes one to make two days. It's this, it actually takes a little bit less, but it also gets more complicated because now you're taking out parts. You need, you have more bench space to do. And I never have enough clamps. It's the joke. You can yes. always, you, even if you have a wall of clamps, you need yep. more clamps. Yeah. My typical estimates are six to eight weeks to go from an order to shipped. And I've, I've been pretty good at getting in it on that time, but sometimes it takes longer if there are issues outside of my control. Gotcha. So a lot of people that are listening, they might be either starting a business uh, using a CNC or just board working or they're growing it. And I feel yeah. like uh, the question a lot of people have is like, how do I price something that I'm making? Oh, it's brutal. Yeah. That's a really hard. How'd you do that initially? Uh, honestly, I, because I didn't have to, I didn't have to do that as a source of income. My prices were ridiculously low, but I didn't know. So as I started saying, Hey, I'm doing this for a living. Then I was looking at how much it cost me to do that, the amount of time. And I just started creeping out the price. 
The other thing too, is as the quality of my cabinets increased, as like I was making custom hardware and there were less mistakes and they were just getting closer to perfection. And I, my prices creeped up to a point where, oh, okay, I'm comfortable doing this. I can sustain at the current sales volume. I can pay all my bills and whatnot and make a little bit of money. That's where I am. It wasn't some crazy formula. It really was how can I do this and have it a sustainable business? And then that's the hardest part from all my friends who do this professionally. It's really hard to price it. And typically what they do is go, obviously take the cost of materials and go how many hours and what is the value of my time? And that would have been a problem for me too, because I'm a little OCD. I get, oh, here's a cool thing I can do. And I just go off the deep end. And now it's okay. Now I'm working for, you know, $3, <laughs> you know? <laughs> where it should be 150 or something because you, you go off the deep end with features and, and whatnot. But I honestly, it's what the market bears. My, my orders are coming in and I also look at competition and my stuff is significantly nicer. So I price it a little higher. Honestly, I think for anybody else and what my experience of my friends is just looking at cost of materials and uh, the value of your time. How, yeah. You make an estimate of how many hours it's going to take and go yeah. that way. Have you found that you're able to adjust your pricing with a different like clientele? Uh, although it sounds like you went like, straight to the top almost from the beginning. But I did. That's actually a really good question. And I, I don't give discounts. And that's one thing. I think people come in and go, here's my name. I do this. And yeah. it's okay. It's, it's great. <laughs> that means you can afford <laughs> my, right. my price that I'm asking. I, I don't mess around. So if somebody else comes in, I don't treat them any differently. I think the difference is that folks who come in, this is a tax write-off. This is what they do for a living. They have very specific constraints of their studio size and power requirements and size requirements. That's where it gets custom. And I, I think that's the only differentiating factor is the amount of customization. And maybe I'll be a little more lenient because they will get more eyeballs on yeah. something. Th these guys do it for a living and I can charge more because it's a tax write-off as opposed to a hobbyist who's, they saved up to get this cabinet and I get that vibe. I'll probably work with them more. But man, if this is a write-off, this is what you do for a living. I'm making a professional tool for them that it improves their workflow. And if there's a wow factor in their studio, I charge exactly what I should charge. Yeah, it's almost, at least when we've talked with people, when you're working with just in customers that are just using thing for personal use, it's a lot different versus talking to businesses or people that this is coming from a whole different budget. Okay, so you mentioned customization. So it sounds like, do you do you sell like templates or is everything customized or like, how, how does that workflow sure work for you. so i i have a basic client it's based on how many rows so i have a five row a six row and a seven row and with that size you can pick any width. i have three different widths you can pick you can pick different woods but basically i use walnut and then you can have the walnut ebony so those are the two different finishes those are my standard but what happens is if they're a professional they have a very specific studio with constraints the one i did with jj he had this crazy brand new home studio that had a sloped wall and he did it at a certain height he actually had 12 rows which is almost double the size of any of my standard cabinets that's incredibly customized I've done other woods with different woods and styles and whatnot but i have three standard cabinets and unfortunately i just got the the x carve pro recently so all the mock-ups that I made for these was with the Shaper Origin, which I love, by the way. It's an amazing tool. It's just slow. It takes me a long time where I put it on the X-Carve, I draw it, click a button, and outside of my clamping time, <laughs> this thing just knocks out parts and it's great. Yeah. Is it the time savings you're finding that's been the biggest benefit? Yeah, it's a combination. It's a time saving plus my straight lines are straight lines. Right. So it's the accuracy. For example, I, I have my logo cut into stuff, engraving. I was using the shaper, but once again, it was very time consuming. I, I'd have accuracy problems because I'd listen to music and space out for a second. Right, right, right. And it would go off track and fart out on the side. But now it's like all my bases have my logo on it. I name all my cabinets okay. and the date that it was built. So those punch those in. It just, it's a combination of accuracy and the speed where I didn't really have that with my other tools available to me at the time. Yeah. So outside of uh, Shaper, had you had much experience with CNC stuff before? Zero. And okay. actually the Shaper is what got me exposed to this using SVG files right out of Illustrator and learning things like making sure that you, your shapes are closed. So when I'm using the pen tool, I get all the way around and make sure that shape's closed or else obviously the machine doesn't know what the shape is. And the easel software seems to be a little more forgiving with that, where I had to do do compound paths and group and all the stuff for the shaper or else it, it really, it, it, it complained you know, more. But honestly, the easel stuff is I bring my shape in, I place it and I go and I've seen 
um, friends that they have a CNC shop that they're exporting G code and all the stuff. And I was like, I, I don't have the time to learn that. And the usual stuff just handles it. I'm also not doing super complicated stuff, two dimensional shape. I use the built in shapes and with an easel to do my rabbits, grooves, dados, all that stuff. And I just learned that I can export that back into illustrator Yep. and then I can manipulate that and then put it back into easel. So that way I have a copy of it in illustrator. Yeah. You can kind of uh, round trip it. If you're talking to someone who was just looking into getting into CNC, like what would you recommend just on the learning side of things or like expectations? Is there something you thought going into it that was actually a lot different as a result or? Honestly, it's the fact that I've been using Illustrator for 10 years. If they have some familiarity with a 2D drawing, you're I, I can't imagine it being hard. I don't, I haven't really played around. I, I don't know if Usual has any freehand type stuff, but the huh? shapes it are does, there yeah. and you can do letters. Bit. So I put my logo down and like I said, I name all my cabinets. It might be goofy, but it actually, I enjoy that. I spent a lot of time with these cabinets. Like that text tool is built in, into the software and their basic shapes and, and whatnot. As long as you have some familiarity with a tool, a 2D drawing tool, I think all of them export as SVG. I, 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 I don't know what the learning curve would be. I think the big thing is learning clamping, learning the path of the the spindle. I, I can tell you as breaking a number of bits because I'm just a bonehead. I wasn't really following where the where it's going to go and understand it being very precise with your measuring the thickness of your workpiece, getting a nice accurate caliper, and then also using the probe. Also very important, so that way it knows where the height of that workpiece exactly. And once I kind of got a workflow for that, I built like a custom desk where it's all handy for me, I knock things out the, the, I think the learning curve for me was a few weeks of, of doing it around the clock because of my specific workflow. It, it didn't take a long time to get that dial. So then I guess the same question, uh, recommendations you would give to someone starting out, but someone who's wanting to start a business around okay. this, are there things you wish you knew when you were first starting out or what would you recommend? The luxury I had was I didn't have to do this. So I would recommend to anyone. Whatever your main hustle is to make a living in life, do not give that up. Make this your side hustle and build it to that way you get to a volume where you can switch over to be, I don't know, I would not have jumped. It would be ridiculous I because the you know sales volume was, I have a month where I'd have eight orders and then I'd go two months without a single one. That would have buried me. So my recommendation is make this a side hustle until you kind of have a market and your sales volume is consistent enough that you can kick over. And also when you kick over, go all in, D don't be scared of it or else you're not going to know. You don't know if the jacket fits you till you put it all the way on. Like you got to go big and it's, it didn't work. At least you took it all the way and then you go back to a, a, a different job. But I, I recommend waiting until that you can do it for sure. And then when you go in, don't half-ass it. Yep. That's a great advice. <laughs> uh, well, Matt, I appreciate you, you taking the time and chatting. Very busy making some super cool stuff. Thank that's you. It's helping out people all over the place, make movies and audio and music and all kinds of crazy stuff. But yeah, thank you so much for jumping on and, and for yeah. chatting. It was, it was a blast. Oh, thanks, Brian. I really appreciate it. Have a good yeah. day.